Hi, this is Rick Simpson again with another review on a product from Intermountain. Uh, we're here today uh, at the South Plains Ethanol Facility. Uh, these are Jeff Ritter's modules. He's a member of the North Texas Fremo Group out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, Jeff's from the Richland Hills area, um, just outside of Fort Worth and models BNSF. Um, so I wanted to take some time, uh, we've been doing some work on his modules, getting them ready for the July meet, and I thought it would be a good opportunity for us to talk about the uh, Intermountain ES44 AC and DC models uh, that they've recently uh, come out with. Um, and I wanted to talk to you today about a method that I've developed uh, where you can actually enhance the sound quality performance of the model. Uh, by just simply upgrading your speaker. Uh, the speaker is located inside the radiator section of this model. Those of you who own them already know that. Um, and I'm going to show you how to take this model apart, install a new speaker, and reattach the shell and get all of your components back together without breaking anything on the model. One of the things uh, on this model that is very, very uh, fragile that you have to be careful of is the material that they use for the handrails. This is a polybutyl styrene. Uh, it's, it's both soft and brittle in its properties, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, it's easily to injection mold, which is why they probably chose this material, but it will not stand up to much uh, pressure or tension without breaking. Uh, if you bend it in one direction and try to straighten it out, it will break. Uh, those of you who have already experienced breakage with these, uh, you know what I'm talking about. So one of the things I want to show you is a method that I have come up with on how to disassemble the model install a new speaker. Uh, we're going to be using an upgraded speaker uh, that is from Railmaster. Uh, Railmaster is a supplier of uh, hobby speakers for model railroading primarily. and They make a really nice speaker, uh, the DSM-8 model. that fits perfectly inside this model. And I'm going to show you that in a little while. Uh, we're going to go over to the workbench in here just a second and I'm going to show you how to take this thing apart and then we're going to do the installation process and we'll go from there. See you soon. Okay, here we are at the workstation. Um, first thing I'm going to show you how to do on this engine is just take the shell apart because that's the biggest issue that people have uh, with taking this model apart is getting it apart without damaging something. I've damaged several myself so I know that other people are having a problem with it. I've been told by it. People have asked me, hey, how are you getting these apart? So what I'm going to do, I've developed a, 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 a technique just to go through step by step take this thing apart and get it back together again so you're not breaking anything and, and having the model ruined in that end. The Intermountain Jivo, uh, the ES44AC or DC version, doesn't really matter. Uh, they're pretty much identical locomotives. Uh, it's a terrific model. Intermountain has done a really nice job on this model. Uh, really a trendsetter. Uh, very, very popular model. There's been some people that would like to get a little bit better sound quality. Uh, the first generation or first run of these models they did, um, they did not have some sound files that were made by soundtracks. Uh, the newer ones do. Uh, so there's a, there's a really good uh, sound file loaded on these boards. Um, one way you can enhance that is by upgrading the speaker. The standard one inch round speaker that is uh, installed from the factory it's, it's adequate, but it's, it really does not allow the full body of sound that is on the sound file come out. Uh, it just doesn't have the capability to do that. So we're going to install a Railmaster DSM-8 speaker. These are from uh, Railmaster Hobbies. Uh, it's a DSM-8 model. It's an 8 ohm. Uh, so if you order it, they make a, a 100 ohm speaker as well uh, for use in European models. Make sure you order the 8 ohm or the DSM-8 version. These are only 1250. It is a terrific speaker. Um, and what we're going to do, let me just show you one. Um, this is the speaker itself. It's already got the pigtail on it. Uh, it's very simple uh, installation and I'll get to that in just a few more minutes. Uh, this speaker fits just very snugly inside the radiator housing of the ES44. We'll actually be placing it in this position inside once we get the mo uh, model apart. So that's um, 
that's the speaker. We'll be leaving that out. Put this over here. Um, let's take the shell apart. I, and I was just telling you earlier, the main thing you want to take uh, caution with on this model is the material that the handrails are made out of is, is very brittle, fragile. You've got to be very careful taking this apart. A lot of people are not sure how to get it apart and they end up taking the wrong thing apart first. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. So my recommendation would be as follows. The first thing you do when you unpack the model, always lift it by the trucks if you can or uh, stay away from avoid touching the top. There are a lot of delicate details right here. These eye lift rings are, are very uh, easy to break off. They're made out of plastic, not metal, so be very cautious when you grab the model. You should always try to lift the model from the fuel tank. When it sits in the cradle, you want to just lift it out like this if you can. Just get your fingers on it and just kind of gently pull up. That will avoid any breakage. Next thing you want to do is we're going to go ahead and remove these phone inserts uh, that support the handrails. Uh, I just use an X-Acto knife. You want to be careful with that, but uh, I just like to do that. My fingers are pretty big, so I, I would end up breaking uh, a lot of things. The first thing we'll do is we'll take these front cab handrails off. You just pull out gently on that and these will pull forward. You've got to be very careful uh, when you pull these loose because again they are in a tight fit in most cases and if you just work gently they will come out by themselves. Uh, once you get them loose I would just use an object like that and they will lift right out. Same thing on this side. Just slip the knife under gently and give it a slight tug. If it feels like it's going to get stuck don't force it. Just lift up gently and we'll go back in and pull it off. There. Alright, we set these aside for now. The next part you want to do, and I do this now so you don't forget, is removing these two little braces at the back uh, because these join between the car body and the radiator and we will be removing this radiator section is a separate piece. So we'll go ahead and take those out and set those aside. All right. Now comes the most challenging part is the long handrails. Just pull these out. And what I do is just lift with a little tug. And this one looks like it's going to be a little stubborn, so let's just give it a little tug. If it don't fight it because if you do, you will lose. Okay. We want to take these first three stanchions out and lift them free because this will remove them from the car body once we lift the cab off. On the other side, you have a little more work to do. We'll start up here, just a gentle tug, and these will come up. Again, it's just take your time and don't force anything. This is the hardest one right here. This is the little... Uh, the little jigster that is really difficult. Sometimes they fit real tight. Uh, this one is not. It will actually get back in here and if you're not very careful when you go to pull this shell off you've got to make sure this clears the body otherwise it'll bend here and it will break. Alright, we've got all of the handrails loose. Now, the next step is to pull here, rocking this back and forth with your index finger and thumb placed on either side of the bottom of the cab. Your other hand, hold in against the stairwell gently. You don't have to grasp it firmly. Just rock it back and forth and pull up gently. As soon as you feel it coming up, check your handrail clearance and make sure that this part is free of your inverter box. And make sure that this side is clear, that these are all on the outside of the car body. Continue to pull up gently. The car body will come off in one piece and you just lift it away. This will expose where your circuit board would be. Now this model that we're using today as an example, I've already removed this board for time um, because we were going to upgrade a board on this model uh, that had a problem on it. Uh, so now you're going to get the added advantage of seeing how that's done. All right. All right, uh, we had a problem on one of Jeff's locomotives, and that's why we're going to take this extra step right now. Uh, this is a new board from Intermountain. Uh, this is actually a replacement board for one that was bad. 
I'm going to go ahead and install this. This is pretty simplified. Um, it sets in on a, a, a support mechanism that's held in place by four screws. So let me go ahead and just get this done. Uh, the first thing I do is I go ahead and get the board in position and make sure all your connectors are plugged in here. And you have three aft. Uh, this is your main motor control connector. You have to just be careful of these wires because they do get in the way of a lot of stuff. So um, I'm going to these lined up. Okay, we have one. And right underneath here is a second. You may have to use a smaller pair of tweezers just to get these things in position. They are tiny connectors. Uh, just be very careful. And again, take deliberate time to uh, do it. Uh, there's always time to do it over again, but there's never enough time to do it the, right the first time. So take your time with it. Avoid any breakage. And if I can do it with these elephant fingers of mine, anybody can do this. This is really a stubborn one. All right, we finally got that one in. Once you have it seated in there, just give it a firm push either with your thumb or your finger just to make sure it snaps into place completely. You want to make sure you've got good electrical connections. And then our last plug for the truck, this is a power truck on the outside. Plug that one in and we're done on the wire. You have four screws. Uh, use a magnetic screwdriver that is uh, a hobby screwdriver type and we'll hold these in. We're going to go ahead and mount the board in. Um, I don't torque these screws down until we get all four in place. And because you're going through a fiber circuit board and into plastic, you don't want to get it cross threaded or it will strip out and you are done. One screw left and in we go. All right. Now just go around one more time. Do one more snug turn, turn and a half. Make sure the board is secure. Be careful not to put too much pressure downward on the board. You could bend it and pull loose your uh, circuit components and damage the uh, componentry or the board itself. So don't pressure. Don't put too much pressure on. Give a final check. I would recommend using a small pair of tweezers. Just give it a gentle tug. Make sure all your connectors are connected properly and you'll be all set to go. All right, that phase is done. This material is uh, a ba adhesive backed foam uh, vibration reduction material. You can buy this at any uh, automotive audio store. Uh, sometimes they throw it away. I just find it in the barrels and I just take it out of the trash. Uh, I don't buy this. But you can buy this at different audio and electronic stores. Uh, it's used for speaker quieting, uh, speaker liners. I use this as a, both a speaker uh, cushion and as a light baffle material. One of the things on the Intermountain model that is just an inherent issue is they seem to leak light around the uh, LEDs for the ditch lights. So what I do is I cut about an inch and a half piece and we're going to wrap it around the base of this um, light LED light circuit board flush with the bottom and what this does is it will cut down on a lot of the light that bleeds out uh, around the front of the cab base on the front step well. Um, they're actually putting something on like this on the later runs uh, but I go ahead and put another piece in there. Uh, this will usually cut down on most of the light. You'll get a better light transmittance of your ditch lights. All right, we're halfway there. Now that we've got the board installed and we're ready to upgrade our speaker, I'm going to flip this over. Right here you'll see a little knife groove that you can stick your fingernail in 
on each side of the frame of the radiator. This will allow the radiator section to snap off, exposing the factory installed speaker. Pulling out slightly on the wall of the radiator will let this tab come loose and you can remove the factory speaker that comes from Intermountain or from the factory. Um, you can dispose of the speaker if you'd like or save it for another project. We'll set it aside for now. This allows us for the space we want. Next step is, is we want to take our speaker and get it to rig to where we can plug it in to our outlet on the board. What we're going to do now is take the connector from the original factory installed one inch speaker, which we're replacing with the DSM-8 speaker from Railmaster. We're going to utilize this connector which connects directly to the factory board. You can just take a pair of rail cutters, snip it about an inch and a half back. You may want to save that speaker for another project. Um, what we'll do now is I'm going to strip the insulation from these two wires so that we can attach, solder them. When I strip the insulation off, I always pigtail these just using your thumb and fingertip uh, or whatever practice you're used to using. Uh, this is mine. Just pigtail it. Then we want to use a little bit of soldering flux paste on just a dab on each wire. You don't need a lot of this, just a touch. We're going to tin those uh, with some solder. <clears throat> and we just want to touch the iron on there just to get enough uh, solder on there to tin the wire. And then we'll set this aside for a moment. Next thing we're going to do is go to the speaker. Now it's entirely optional. I've done it both ways. Um, you can cut this long pigtail off. It's about five inches long total. Um, with this locomotive uh, that we're working with right now, you can actually shove any excess wire back in once the shell's back on. I'll get to that in a little while. Um, but some people might prefer, and I've done it on certain installations, I've cut this a little shorter. It's entirely up to uh, preference. So. What I'm going to do to save some time is just go with the full length of the wire um, and I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing we just did before uh, with the connector end. I'm going to tin these wires, a little bit of solder, just a touch on there. You don't need a lot. You don't have to hold the iron on there. As a matter of fact, if you do, you'll burn the insulation off, so you don't want to do that. <clears throat> okay, once you've got that done, the next thing you want to do is take a pair of uh, cutters. It doesn't be anything fancy. The DSMA speaker comes with two little loops on here uh, that have eyelets on them for mounting with screws. I don't know of any application where they'd be used in HO scale. So they're going to be in the way. I would just cut them off and it's very simple. You just take a pair of cutters, cut on the side away from the wire on this particular ear and just lob the ear off and throw it away. Do it on this side as well. And just throw it away. Okay, you can, if you want to file this down, if you're a neat freak, you can do that. It doesn't matter on this installation. Another thing you can do, something I do, is I just remove this label. Uh, the less stuff that you have inside the engine, the less you can have to go wrong. I don't know what this would do, but I just get rid of it. So. All right, all right, so now we're ready to basically do our install. What we're going to do is get some heat shrink and uh, I'm going to slide it on to insulate these two solder joints and then we're going to go install the engine. Okay, the next step is uh, we're going to slide on a piece of heat shrink tubing. Uh, you can buy this at any electronics store. Radio Shack carries it. At least most of them. Altex Electronics is another good source. Um, we don't need a big type. You want to use the smallest size consistent with the wire code you're using. Um, so we're going to slide these little pieces of heat shrink, uh, push them back at least about an inch from the end because they are sensitive to the heat. And when we start connecting the wires together with solder, uh, the, the heat will transfer to the wire and it could cause it to start 
shrinking if it's too close to the solder joint. I would recommend using a pair of uh, surgical clamps to hold your wires in position while you're soldering it just give you an extra hand and then we're going to go ahead and put a little bit more tinning flux on here uh, you can put it on all four ends or you can just do it on two it will be sufficient always make sure you're using a, uh, a lot of care when you're soldering don't burn yourself or get any heat around the model you don't want to damage anything okay here we go we're going to attach this wire let it cool just for a moment then we'll go over here and we'll line this up and boom that's all there is to it now the next step we'll go ahead and slide the heat shrink up onto our joint that we just did on both wires you can do these one at a time or both at the same time it doesn't matter now the key to the heat shrink is is we want to shrink the tubing around that joint so that, that the joint will be sealed and insulated from any contact. And you can do that with just the edge of your iron. Um, I found this to be a very simple process. Just uh, place the heat shrink right up against the side of your uh, soldering iron just to get enough heat transference to shrink the tubing. And if you can roll it between your fingertips like that, it's a little warm but it'll be alright. You can see how that shrank up very tight around the wire and now that joint is insulated. All right, then the next phase of this, uh, we're done pretty much with everything. We're going to be installing the body shell in just a moment. The first thing we have to do, though, is we've got to plug our speaker back into the board, and we're going to do that right now. Um, I'm going to insert this using a small pair of tweezers. Uh, make sure it lines up with the top. It connects back into this side. Um, there's a little rib at the top. I'm usually better doing this with my fingers, so let's just get it started. Okay, once you get it started in there, just press it in and that will snap right into place. Okay, it's secure now. Okay, the next step, take the car body of the locomotive. We've got the radiator section removed. What we're going to do is thread the speaker right through the car body, wiring pulled right out, and just leave it set here on the workbench. Okay, now, this is the time where you're going to go ahead and reattach the body shell to the actual locomotive chassis. And the important step here is just like removing it, we want to make sure we clear those, those uh, very fragile handrail components out of the way while we're installing the cab or, or the uh, car body back onto the locomotive shell or uh, back onto the car body. Now we did a couple of things. We put some insulation uh, up in here under the lighting. If you remember around the ditch lights we wanted to seal off any leakage on that. So what you have to do is just gently work this down onto the chassis again. Make sure you get this joint aligned properly and over here on this side you want to make sure you see how this is pulling down you want to make sure this stays up on this surface right here uh, the body will snap right on and then you can go ahead at this point and reattach your handrails uh, using either a small pair of tweezers or your uh, fingers whichever you're more dexterous to do these will probably go right in place very easily and just kind of feel them in and um, we'll do the same thing on the other side. Uh, just gently line up the pin on the back of the handrail stanchion and let them go into place. This one fits down through the floor of the walkway. So we just want to push it down in. Last but not least is the connection to the cab. And we're done on that. We'll install the white... Uh, stanchions or the, I'm sorry the white handrails uh, last uh, we'll do that last okay now we're ready to go ahead and position the speaker what I would recommend is the material that we talked about earlier this is a material we use to black out the uh, block out the uh, extraneous light around the ditch light LEDs we're going to use the same foam with the adhesive back to put strips on each side of the inside of your radar radiator housing and what this does is it will uh, help not only help 
stabilize the position of the speaker, but it will also keep down any harmonic resonance transferring from the speaker body to the shell, which would cause some vibrating noise. We don't want that. Just cut a random length, doesn't have to be anything. And again, you can purchase this at just about any electronics or uh, store that sells speakers or speaker accessories, uh, especially an audio speaker um, dealer. All right, now what we're gonna do is, we're on the final stage of this, we're gonna loop this wire around with our finger. Because uh, we wanna put it back in through the shell. Just gonna set it in there and we're gonna feed it back in with just a pair of tweezers or your finger. Gently, just a little bit at a time, until we get the speaker position where we want it. Now, this particular model has a low headlamp on the back. It's the BNSF version, so it has the low headlight LED uh, tube inside, which is great. Uh, the ones that have the high mounted light up in the radiator section uh, actually limit a little bit more space. You've got to, you're, you're limited on what position you can put the speaker in. On this, you have a little more flexibility, which is good. The airport port intake uh, is uh, this hole right here. This allows air to get in behind the speaker uh, and allow more air to move around the speaker cone uh, so that it will bring out more of the bass reflex. Um, you can try this to your preference. I have found personally that uh, I get the best speaker sound with this hole toward the rear uh, and that's how I'm going to do this installation. You can also place the speaker upward or in the downward position, which one ever you prefer based on the results you get. My experience, it's always better to face the speaker down because again, you have more air and more space below the speaker than you do above once the radiator section is attached for air to move around it. So we'll get a little better resonation that way. All right, here we go. I'm just gonna sit the speaker down in there just to kind of test fit it. Um, it just fits in there just perfectly like that. Um, and we are just about perfect right there. I'm gonna make a minor adjustment. Make a little bit more room here with moving a few of the factory wires around. And this speaker will drop right into place. Okay, and that's that's pretty much it. You might want to take an extra piece of this uh, foam and just lay it across the top um, just to give it a little insulation against the radiator section. At this point, you can clear your little grab irons, the ones that have the little grabs at the back. You want to swing those out of the way so they'll reattach to the car body. You don't want to bend or break those off. We'll just go ahead and snap on the radiator section. It snaps right into place. We'll go ahead and install the grab irons, and we're pretty much done. I've found that it's usually best to insert this onto the car body end first. Um, let's see if I can line it up. Take your time with anything that you're doing like this because these parts are very small and you could damage them as well as the model if you're not careful. Once you get it in that hole, this one goes back in. Just some small attention to detail will yield uh, an excellent result. And there you have it. You can actually put a little drop of glue on these if you want. A little white canopy glue is actually best. I would avoid using ACC if you ever have to do any service on this where you have to remove this again. Maybe make a speaker adjustment. You don't want those glued too tightly in there. It could damage the paint. So I found that the white canopy glue, it dries totally clear. You just need a tiny drop on each end of the wire and it will set them in place and keep them in place. That way they won't fall off on the layout somewhere. Okay, as you can see, I've got the front handrails installed uh, and our work is complete. The engine uh, locomotive has been completely reassembled. Nothing broken, nothing damaged. Uh, a very good result. Now we're going to take the model in and we're going to put it on uh, some of the Fremo modules and we're going to test it out, adjust our CVs on our DCC decoder and get the sound maximized for the best benefit. All right, here we 
are. The engine we just installed the speaker in. The next step is we're going to do some programming functions with it. And uh, I'm going to go through that with you very quickly. And we'll be finished and ready to run our engine. Um, the uh, system we're using is Digitrax, so I'll be using that to program these engines. You may use NCE or whatever system. That's fine. I'll work the same. First thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to program the lighting, and then we're going to work on the sound. Because out of the box, the ditch lights flash back and forth, we're going to correct that for these units. There are six CVs that you want to adjust to uh, program your lighting uh, right out of the box. Um, the factory defaults are probably not going to be right, depending on what road you model. So if most universal settings will require the change of six CVs, 49 through 54. On this particular locomotive, we want to use Rule 17 lighting, so you want to adjust your headlight and your rear headlight to be able to be dimmed with a decoder function on your command control hand throttle throttle. So we're going to change, you want to change CV 49 and 50 to a value of 129. On CV 51 through 54, which controls the functions of your ditch lights and number boards, along with the headlight, you want to change those four CVs to a value of 128. The result will be a dimmable headlight, which we'll demonstrate for you now. By pressing function 7 on your control, you have a dim and a bright headlight, dim, light, bright light, dim. This will re work on your reverse mode as well. The other functions will be your ditch lights, which is on this particular uh, program. It's uh, function 6 on a Digitrax handheld throttle. Your number boards are eliminated with function 5. So you can control all three of your lighting functions independently of one another, which is really nice because if you want to have your locomotives parked in the yard, you can have the headlight dimmed in a siding or the light off for a parked locomotive, leaving your number boards illuminated, which is a really, really nice feature in the Intermountain Jeeva. Okay, let's get back to our programming on the BNSF engine that we installed the new board in. The um, next CV we're going to go to is uh, we're going to jump up to the factory default master volume which is 128 and we're going to set that to a value of about 230 that's a soundtracks recommended norm uh, for Atherin and Intermountain engines just as a point of departure should be already factory defaulted to that setting so you probably won't notice any change there 129 is your horn you always want to set that to maximum value of 255 Horn's the loudest thing on the engine, so you want to hear it over everything else. 130 is your bell. Um, the factory default on this is around 65. I find it's a little bit too loud. I'm going to let you hear that. And then we'll back it down to what I think is a more realistic volume. Here's the bell volume from the factory. Um, once you got the prime mover going and everything, it's still loud, but it kind of overrides the horn so what we'll do is cut that back down to about uh, a value of about 45 and that tames it down just a little bit so that's a little bit better setting you might even want to go down to 40 depending on where you like it okay next is um, we're going to go uh, to the prime mover uh, let me shut the bell off okay on the prime mover which is CV number 131 um, again, the factory default can be a little overwhelming. Um, you can hear it there. I bumped it up to about the factory default. Let's pull it down. I'm going to set this just under uh, about 75. Uh, actually, let's take it down to 70 for now, and we can fine tune it later once we get all of our other sound volumes where we want them. Um, 32 is your compressor sounds. I would recommend about 50 or 55 on that. I'm going to select 55 for now. Um, on 134, we'll skip 133. Uh, that's your dynamic brakes. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to cover that because uh, the recording they used is just out of, I don't even know what it's supposed to be, but it's not a dynamic brake uh, sound. Anyway, uh, 34 is your uh, compressor control, so let's, let's adjust that. That cuts your fan noise down on 134 is your uh, fan, uh, fan noise. 
So we've got that cut down pretty good. Uh, 45 is a good setting for that. You can just barely notice it at idle. Now we're going to jump over to 143, which is our uh, poppet valve. Um, I like this a little louder. Uh, most people don't. Um, you can set it to about 60. Uh, I usually set mine to about 75. It's a random sound file, so it's, it's not something that will trigger. But I like to be able to hear it. It's, uh, it's a random file. So it comes on and off by itself uh, randomly. Now we're going to jump up to CB153. This is our equalizer uh, base uh, start point. This goes through 1 through 7. 7 is your customizable feature. So we're going to go to 7. But before I do that, I'm going to let you listen to all of these uh, through one, uh, from 0 through 7 right now. Just listen to the variances if you can. This is 0, 1, not much difference. You go to 2, changes your higher frequencies a little. 3 is going to focus mainly on the bass frequencies. Four is mid-tones. Five is, again, mid-range, a little less frequent, high frequency end. Six takes out your high frequency and focuses on the bass and mid-tones. And seven is your customizable. And this is where we're going to set all of our other sound settings from seven. So we'll select seven on one, uh, CV-154 and 155. You want to set them to neutral, which is a 128 value. So we'll set the uh, 153, I'm sorry, 154 and 155 to a value of 128. Just enter those in. 128, enter. Uh, and then starting with 156, the factory setting uh, is probably going to be somewhere around 165 to 170. I like to bump that up a little bit just to pull out a little more bass tone. These uh, real master speakers really will produce a lot more bass quality sound. So you can, you can actually push these to the envelope a little bit more. I'm going to go in and select this right at 195. And you'll notice an immediate difference in the prime mover sound. Pull that up. 157. Uh, we'll set it to a value of 140. 158, you want to set to 160. 159, about 145. And by the way, I'm getting these values uh, just as a medium recommended uh, practice. You can set these and tone these to anything you like. These are just points of departure. Okay, and then 60 is our high frequency band. We want to set that to about 200. By the way, these are the same settings used on the Atherin Genesis engines for those of you who own both the Intermountain and Atherin Genesis. These are universally interchangeable settings. Okay. 161 is your uh, uh, reverb control. 161 you want to set to a value of about 8. 7 is recommended. 7 or 8 will be fine. 162 you want to set to a value of 180. Uh, 163 and CV 164 you want to set to a value of uh, 32. I'll just set these to both to 32. The last CV we'll change will be 169. And that's your trim. Uh, we're going to set that to 10. Don't usually want to exceed that. So we're all programmed in. Now let's listen to the engine uh, with the bell. Check our volumes. Horn. Nice loud horn. Um, what we might want to do is bring the prime mover sound back up. So we'll go back into CV131, uh, which is your prime mover exhaust volume. And let's bring that up to about 85. And we'll try 95. That's about good right there, at least for my room that I'm in right now. Now, this is an important thing. When you're programming your sounds, you have to take into consideration the... Uh, uh, surroundings, the, the, um, how much carpeting is in a room, the type of ceilings you have, the acoustics overall can have a dramatic effect on this. So 
you may have to tune these depending on where you're running them. If you're on a club or a club environment where it's very noisy usually, uh, this will probably not matter because you probably won't hear it a whole lot anyway. And on home layout or club layout, depending on the uh, um, surroundings, uh, carpeting, the ceiling type, the acoustics overall, the type of wall you have, even the type of uh, layout material that the track is mounted on can have an effect on the overall sound. So let's run the engine, see how it sounds. Thanks again for watching. Hope you enjoyed this, and I hope that this was helpful. And we'll have some more reviews coming up and how-to instructionals on the several different projects I got working. Thanks again for watching. Take care.